come true My Isle of Love misses your embrace Since you went away It's a dreary place So hurry, my darling, come back And then it will be my heart of love once again Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Stories, our program which features stories about old Hawaii before the 1700s. Today I have with me Mr. William Ayla, the harbor master here on the Waianae Coast. Aloha Bill and welcome to our program. Aloha Karen, thank you for having me at uh, Poka'i Bay. Can you please share with us the meaning behind Poka'i Bay? Sure, Poka'i um, is actually a, a newer name uh, the older name for this area behind us is Malaya and uh, Poka'i comes to us from a chief who arrived here a long time ago his name was Poka'i and he's famous for two things he's famous for bringing the cornerstones for Kui Leo Loa Heiau um, and, and dedicating it as a, a navigational heiau and the second thing that he's famous for is bringing coconuts which eventually sprouted and uh, were planted in a grove behind us here where the uh, Norfolk Island pine trees are uh, next to Kaupuni stream where currently they exist a Baptist church but it used to be the uh, Wainai sugar plantation managers house those coconuts that he had planted there uh, for 100 150 years thereafter were, were a very famous grove of coconut trees and had the reputation of having the sweetest uh, coconut water and coconut milk along the entire Waianae coast. Do you know if any of those coconut trees still exist out on our coast? Well, unfortunately, that was you know probably four or five hundred years ago. None of the original trees are still in existence. However, the uh, progeny of those trees still exist in and around the area right there. And as we share about our coconut trees, I know you have a story about the sandalwood industry. Sure. The, the bay behind us right here um, was a famous fishing village uh, prior to Western contact. And so Hawaiians came and gone, uh, came and went. And if you could imagine uh, double hauled canoes similar to Hokulea uh, transporting in and out of this bay. I mean, that was a regular thing. Then later on, uh, 1793, Vancouver was the first um, white man to sail into this bay, Poka, what we call Poka'i today, drop anchor and um, take a look around. The natives came out to meet him and told him if he would just wait till tomorrow morning, uh, their chief would come out and uh, share with him the uh, food from the area. Uh, the chief could not come out because he was under kapu that day. Vancouver looking at the mountainside and seeing it as sort of a very desolate place decided not to wait. Had he waited he would have seen um, canoes on the beaches, uh, fish drying on the shore. If he had just taken a, a little tour up to uh, Waianae Valley, Pu'ea, those areas he would have seen hundreds of acres of taro in the back valleys. If he had turned to his left near Kamaile where Kamaile Elementary is today and further back towards the base of the mountain he would have seen huge uh, taro lo'i back there and would have seen how abundant food was along the Wainai coast. It was so abundant that the population was so large that this area behind us, in fact the area that um, the area where the uh, Baptist Church is right now once had three major heiau in around that area. So that shows how big a population there was. Interesting. So um, after our sandalwood trade, um, what came next? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the sandalwood okay. before we go next. After Vancouver left 
uh, right around the turn of the century, um, some sailors that passed through discovered that in Hawaii there was this wood that had a nice fragrance to it. And those that traveled to China recognized it as sandalwood. And so it became, um, it became for about 20 years the product that drove the economy in Hawaii. Um, Wainai was very famous, or there's a very famous accounting of how Kamehameha, shortly before he died, ordered the equivalent of two ships to be brought down, the equivalent in sandalwood of two ships to be brought down to the shore at Pokai in order to make payment on two ships that he had purchased from Westerners. So that tells you that, it tells you of the health of the forest and it tells you also tells you of the um, workforce that was necessary to go into the mountains, cut that, haul it all the way back down. No equipment, no machinery at that time. This is all done by hand bring it down to the shoreline and it tells you how smart Kamehameha was in terms of trading too. And can you share with us a brief description for our viewers out there who are not aware of the importance of sandalwood, um, if they, what they, the uses of sandalwood was? Sure. Sandalwood was a, a, very, um, a very important wood in China because incense was made from it and furniture that had a sweet fragrance was made for it so it's highly prized so what would happen is the fur traders from the pacific northwest would come to hawaii pick up sandalwood go to china sell the fur and the sandalwood come back to hawaii to provision to go back up uh, during the next summer in the pacific northwest so it became part of a regular uh, train uh, trading outpost so to speak now about 20 years the stands of sandalwood were over harvested and the next industry that came to Wainai was sugar. So in about 1880 Herman Wiedemeyer, the first plantation manager, in fact that's his house where the uh, Baptist church is right now, first plantation manager came to Wainai, purchased land, made some lease agreements with other folks and began the Wainai sugar plantation. Um, Later on, your viewers will see some photographs of the mill, the sugar mill, and of the uh, loading dock that was built in order to support the sugar production facilities. Sugar lasted in Wainai from about the 1880s to about the 1940s. Um, the next big use of pokai in the 1940s uh, came about right after World War II, when uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed and so this area became a training area for amphibious landings and you'll see in the in the background later on when uh, it's edited you'll see some photos of some ships some amphibious ships uh, landing uh, and being staged at Pokai Bay. Uh, you will also notice from those photographs that there are no break walls that this was just a, a big open beach and what we see today and what we've grown up with you and I always knowing that the sand was here was not the case in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. The waves used to come through and break and go up on the beach. So it would be just like any other beach along the Waianae coast where the sand would be pulled out during the winter and then deposited back on shore again during the summer. So the break walls which were put in this break wall in the 1950s to protect the beach and to make a harbor um, has resulted in the accretion of a lot of sand back there. So the beach that we grew up with, the beach that we see today, is not the beach that the generation that preceded us grew up with. I notice in the background there are a um, few structures in the, I believe it's the Army Recreation Center. Did that come into play during the time that the Army started with their um, training? Well, in 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed and uh, martial law was declared. So quite a bit of land in Hawaii was um, taken into possession by the U.S. military for the war effort. At about the same time, I think 1943, this beach, that, uh, this part of this beach, the, the portion that now houses the Waianae Pili Laau Recreation Center, we grew up as rest camp, that area. Um, 
was was taken by the military for use in those amphibious landings and later became uh, a recreational area for the U.S. Army. So that's why you see those cabins back there. It's still utilized today by the uh, U.S. Army. There are families who were forcibly evicted from that area who still claim that, that they should be allowed to go back in there. The, the last house on the, on, the, on the right is called the Harvey House, and there are, there are families that um, still claim descendancy to the people who live there. So, And is that that white home with the gray roof? That is correct. It's the only uh, older looking house because all of the other facilities have been rebuilt and actually made um, stormproof. And can you share with us about this um, breakwater area here? Because I, if I can recall correctly, there were some boats that were docked here at one time in the 70s. Well, from the mid 50s, when the brick wall was constructed, uh, there was actually one more brick wall out here, not a brick wall, excuse me, one more pier that the military put in. It was called the Iron Pier. When, you were, when I was growing up, it was called the Iron Pier, and it was kind of dilapidating already and falling. But it was a favorite place for us youngsters to come out and dive from and jump from. Um, in about the 1960s, they cut the rest of that down because it was deemed unsafe. The brick wall was built and a mooring field was actually put in here for a fishing fleet that began to grow. Um, many Hawaiians but also many Japanese fishermen because during the war Japanese weren't allowed to fish. So from 1946 uh, when the war was over many of the Japanese fishing families uh, retrieved their, their vessels which were stored in areas that unaccessible to them and began to fish. So many of them like Colleen Hanabusa, Senator Hanabusa's grandfather uh, got his boat, anchored it here and began to make a living once again from fishing. I have recently begun to see the Muhe'e in small numbers come back in several places along the Wainai Coast. One of them being the harbor, one of them being Makaha Surfing Beach, Kahi Power Plant. These are all places that I've seen the Muhe'e come back. So who knows with the, with the um, banning of the drift gill net fleets it looks like they're starting to make a comeback if you can share with us bill what was on the left of the pili la'au um, recreation center sure. what exists there today first uh, for the viewers is the uh, waianae lifeguard substation and that area right there used to in the night right around 19 uh, excuse me 1890 through about the early 1900s was a two-story hotel uh, built by John Dossett, who was the son-in-law of Herman Wiedemeyer. And uh, the reason that that became a gathering place is because at about the same time, Dillingham built a railroad around the island this side. So there was a place for people to come and stay. Um, the break walls at the end of the uh, beach there at the Wainai Rec Center never used to be there and actually the, sh the stream, Kaupuni stream and the ocean used to go all the way back into about where um, Ray Saito's fuel station is now. That wasn't there. That was all uh, beach. So that area has been built on fill. So if you can imagine back there that time, that opening and that whole area. In fact, Kaupuni stream used to go all the way back to the base of that mountain, Kamaileunu, and meet up with the large marsh that was there. And the marsh was a re well, the marsh was a result of the overflow of Kamaili Springs and the ocean meeting. And one of the one of the thoughts about why why and I got its name is for the large mullet that used to be caught way up there at the base of the mountain. So I mean, our children today will never could never conceive of something like that. What did we do with that beautiful marsh? We filled it in and we made it, the city and county made it a rubbish dump. You know, the generation that preceded us would say, when the ducks flew, the sky would darken. That's how many birds, wild birds used to be there. Wetland birds used to be there. Um, today, what do we see behind us? We see canoes, we see kids jumping off the brick wall, which they shouldn't be doing. We see people snorkeling, diving, swimming. Um, you know, I, I learned to swim here. How about you? Well, I learned to swim and my sister learned to swim and 
my children learn to swim all at Pokai Bay. And I think that's something indicative of, you know, the families that live out here. We, we know that when we come out here, this is where everyone learns to, you know, swim first time in the ocean. And um, another thing, in addition to our um, Pokai Bay area, um, would we include the boat harbor? Well, uh, after Pokai was closed, the harbor was closed in about uh, 1981, 82. The um, use of or the access to the h access to the ocean by boats was switched over to the new boat harbor, that's uh, a little bit further northwest of the old Pokai Bay. So we have a 146 slip marina there now. Uh, it has really become the focal point for fishing, but. The good old days, fishing occurred here, where boats would be lined up. The, the trailer boats, what they used to call the mosquito fleet, would be lined up to launch early in the morning from Pokai Bay Street, all the way back on Bayview Drive, all the way back to where Pizza Hut is now. It would, that's, what, that's where all the trailers would be lined up to launch and retrieve. And the Pokai Bay Bonanza Fishing Tournament, which was a huge fishing tournament in the 70s and 80s, used to be run from here. And uh, believe it or not, the Kiavi tree, where the fish used to be weighed, there's a weigh station right there, is still there today. Um, also, another very famous fishing tournament that began here and sort of ended at the, at the boat harbor was called the International Allison Tuna Fishing Tournament. It was the equivalent of the Hawaii International Billfish Tournament, but this was the International Ahi Tournament, and it was famous for guys catching large ahi on really light line. They would go down to 20 pound test and catch ahi 150, 160, 170 pounds in weight. And the method of launching their boats was they would go get these old landing mats from the U.S. Air Force landing mats because that's, that's what they used to make the airfields out of and they would put it on the sand line it up and then each person would have to back their boat and trailer into the water on the landing mat and if somebody happened to be a bad driver and fell off then everybody would have to come and help carry the trailer and the boat back onto the landing mats so there were a lot of there was a lot of camaraderie and a lot of um, Teamwork. teamwork and partnership been going on for fishing and why was famous the fishermen who fished in the 50s said they would never go more than two miles offshore the boat would be full of fish and they would have to turn around and come home they never went past black rock or mauna lahi lahi they never went past maili point or pu'u o hulu hulu because there was so much fish in this one area and how is it today Nowadays we have to go 40 miles and 50 miles to catch fish sometimes. And, and do you attribute that to overfishing? I think that I attribute that to a lot of overfishing but on an industrial scale. Um, in the whole Pacific we have fleets that can, uh, for example, one tuna per seiner can carry 200 metric tons of tuna in one trip. That's the equivalent of all of the little boats and the longliners in Hawaii in one year. One boat can do that in one trip and there are thousands of those boats. So it's, it's not so much the, the little boats over here impacting this area as it is the large commercial industrial fleets that are. In fact, one of the things that we can look forward to and it's a bad thing is within our lifetime, there will be limits placed on how many tunas you can catch. And speaking of tunas or ahi, um, we have ahi fever. Well, Ahi Fever is the latest tournament to come out of Waianae and it was born at the Waianae Boat Harbor and continues to be run from there. Uh, we have 260 entrants. We've capped it at that because uh, any more would cause mayhem at the harbor. I mean just 260 boats equals about four fishermen per boat so that's a thousand people. Then you add the families and then you add the sightseers and there can be anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 people at the Waianae Boat Harbor while this tournament is going on. Uh, it's a great economic boon to the Waianae Coastal when it's here because everybody's shopping at the stores, um, everybody is full of excitement. Sometimes we're lucky enough to uh, uh, have a whole laulea happening at the same time and it just leverages the use of those facilities for a larger audience. 
And what time of year is Ahi Fever take place? Ahi Fever is strategically placed right around Father's Day so that all the fathers can use Father's Day as an excuse to go fishing. It's one way to get the family to let them go fishing. That's a good idea. Um, we have, um, do we have any other activities happening in our Pokai Bay besides the canoe and swimming? Pokai Bay City and County Park has got a brand new canoe halau being built. So that's, that's something that's on the horizon. Um, we have conduct two canoe clubs that are growing. There's an there's a, there's a interest in canoe paddling today that uh, uh, we haven't seen in the past. So the canoe clubs are beginning to outgrow their uh, the area that they're assigned to. Nanakuli is going through the same thing. Makaha is going through the same thing. So one of the things that we'll have to address in the near future is how do we how do we allow this sport which is great for our kids because it, number one, keeps them healthy, keeps them out of trouble, teaches them teamwork, teaches them discipline. How do we find more space for them for this canoe um, activity to grow? And uh, there's a little bit of room at uh, the Army Rec Center. Maybe we can work something out with the military over there for future growth. Bill, what other uses um, was Poka'i Bay used for other than what we've um, discussed? Well, in, in ancient times, um, this was a site of Ku'ilio Loa Heiau, uh, or Kane'ilo Point, uh, depending on who you listen to. Um, Ku'ilio Loa Heiau, uh, again, depending on who's telling the story, was either a heiau that was used for teaching of navigation. Uh, it was a heiau that's when Kamehameha came and conquered Oahu, many of the uh, priests uh, from the conquered areas came to this area and sort of kept the knowledge of Oahu uh, in place. The other famous thing that this area was famous for was salt. Making salt in the tide pools that surround the heiau. Today, you wouldn't do that because the area is not kept very clean. But if you were to come and visit during the winter time when there's a lot of salt spray uh, after three or four weeks of this you would find nice clean sea salt in these ponds and you could scoop them up take it home and dry it and actually use it and that salt is actually better for you because it has a lot of trace minerals which the uh, rock salt that you buy in the store does not have it also has a better taste if you talk to people who eat a lot of salt they'll tell you that sea salt is much better tasting and flavors food much better than the rock salt. Bill, lastly, can you share with us how you see the future of Poka'i Bay and uh, future use? Well, Karen, I hope it continues to be a place where families can gather safely, where kids can continue to be taught how to swim safely in an environment that we don't have to worry about drug dealing and trash. There are a lot more seniors that are using the beach to stay healthy. I see them swimming back and forth. Uh, there's a lot more fishermen that are coming down. Sometimes it can be a problem if a lot of people are swimming and the fish are there, then you have lines crossing and uh, you know, a little bit of user conflict there. But hopefully we can work those things out. Um, believe it or not, the fish are coming back in here because it's part of a protected area. So there's large schools of Akuli that can be found here um, there's large schools of veke in here. There's a big pile of red veke that swim back and forth. Turtles, as we saw earlier, the turtles are returning. Uh, it's just a place where people can get back in tune with, with the environment as it begins to heal itself. One of the consequences of the break wall kind of breaking down and fall, uh, falling apart is the water quality in Pokai Bay has increased dramatically to the point where corals are actually growing back on the bottom. There are portions in Pokai Bay now, we have coral heads that are starting to be, um, starting to regrow. And, and when that starts happening, then you get the different species of fish that feed on coral and live in and around coral, they're coming back. So for example, butterflies that are pretty rare around here, like teardrop butterflies, they're yellow with a sort of a black teardrop in the middle of their body they're beginning to be found again in Pokai Bay. Believe it or not, the other day I was down here, I actually saw a manta ray come in here and actually feed on some plankton. 
So you know, you see the uh, sometimes you see the videos of manta rays swimming in a circle and they're feeding. Well, he was doing that in Pokai Bay. Believe it or not, with people swimming right around and no more than about 20 feet from the shore, and no one you knew he was doing that. No, it's because I was up on the break wall and could see it. The one thing that I'd like to see is I like to see people respect the closed area a little bit more. Because when we got here, I saw a few folks spearing here. Um, and they, everyone in Wainai knows that this is a fisheries management area and you're not supposed to spear. So that respect, yeah. Understanding that um, we all have to have some areas where we do not take from so that they can reproduce for the areas that we can take from. So the future of Pokai Bay is perhaps a classroom where we teach values and we watch the environment rebuild itself in a clean way. Very good. Thank you so much, Phil. There was a lot of information shared within this short period, and I'd just like to appreciate you coming down and um, sharing your mana'o with us. Thank you. And with that said, I'd like to thank all of our viewers for viewing Hawaii Stories. My name is Karen Oana. I'm your host. Aloha. Dreary place So hurt